Thanks everybody for coming. Um, my name is uh, Jamie Fisher. I'm the uh, director of the Davis Humanities Institute, UC Davis Humanities Institute, I should say. Uh, and I'm delighted to have Professor Eric Smoodin here tonight from the Department of uh, American Studies at UC Davis uh, to talk about his book. Uh, you know, the, the DHI is a leading advocate for the humanities and arts on campus. And uh, a big part of what we do is promote um, research um, as well as programming for the general public with the claim that uh, the research produced here at the university can be pertinent, should be pertinent in, in public experiences and debates. And our book chat series uh, aims to bring um, the cutting edge research that our faculty are carrying out to the general public. And um, I'm especially delighted tonight because <clears throat> my dear colleague, friend, Professor Eric Spoon is here tonight with his new book, um, Paris in the Dark, Going to the Movies in the City of Light, 1930 to 1950, out from Duke University Press just this year. Is that right, Eric? Yes, 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 it's hot, hot off so. the press, yeah. And um, so we'll, um, the format will be that Eric and I, I'll ask Eric some questions. We'll discuss the book for maybe 25, 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions from the floor. Um, just a reminder that we're using Zoom webinar. Uh, so uh, probably the best format for asking questions is the Q&A box, and then I'll just read them off to, to Eric, um, and he will hopefully answer them. Hopefully, he'll find them. <laughs> so, um, well, congratulations again on the book. Um, I think it's fantastic. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Uh, must have been a, it must have been a lot of fun to write and research. I can only imagine it was a, a great great fun to read it. So, um, well, that's really kind. Thank you. Yeah. And um, you know, at the DHI, we're engaged with um, kind of promoting, supporting research by our faculty and graduate students, and also our undergraduate students. And so, I usually ask, begin by asking people, sort of, what were the origins of this project? And one of the pleasures of the book was reading about your kind of personal connection to the topic. So, I was wondering if you could talk about that a bit. Yeah, what I read, I always like to fi find out where a book comes from, what people were thinking about. And uh, in this case, you know, we talk about scholarship that takes a long time, and it's kind of a joke. But uh, with a book like this, I really started to think about it, I'm fairly certain, 40 years ago uh, when I was doing a year of grad school in Paris. But I didn't know it at the time. You know, I was from surprised when I got there by the cinematic space and time in Paris. Uh, I wasn't used to movies being right in the middle of residential. that I was there, it showed a single film, a Fritz Lang film, The Bengal Tiger. When I went to see it, I think I was the only person in the audience, but somehow it stayed there for the whole year. So I think I started thinking then about how movies connect to neighborhoods and how movies move through a space and how they're connected to time and the city itself. And I, I think I was much more interested in um, films then and less interested in kind of the social aspects, the film culture of the period. But as time went on, I got much more interested in those aspects of film studies. I, I started to do this work in relation to some American cities and that work was hard to do. It's always hard to find the evidence of films in a cer certain place. And then about 15 or 20 years ago, I was in Paris uh, and my wife and I just stumbled upon this amazing store that's no longer there that sold magazines. It's all it's just sold old magazines. And I went to the place where the movie magazines were and found this great cache of old magazines of Pour Vu, which was published between 1928 and 1940. And on the back page of every issue were all the movies playing in Paris and all of the neighborhoods, what they cost, what the times were. Uh, what the metro stops were. And so, you know, I started to get a sense from that of sort of the cinematic geography of Paris. Um, and really that was the beginning of the pro project, my year in grad school, then finding the kind of material that I did. And then I was just so lucky because um, at about the same time there became, and we might talk about this a bit later too, just so many more materials available online. So the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris published really millions of items. And so I could spend most of my time uh, in the Bibliothèque Nationale study, 
leading old French movie magazines. And <clears throat> so the best thing about the project was not having to leave home to do it. And that was also the worst thing. I didn't have to go to Paris to do the, to do the book, but uh, it really opened up some incredible possibilities for getting the primary materials of film culture, where films were, how they moved through the city, what cinemas were being built, what stars were popular, that kind of thing. And so the book had a long genesis, I think, from my year in Paris, then a kind of a discovery that I made of a single magazine or two, and then this incredible possibility of reading materials online from, from France. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that is uh, encouraging news to all of us who have unfinished research projects <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that can come to fruition. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you touched upon this, uh, this probably would be another of my questions is kind of how do you define the archive for yeah. your project? And I guess, you know, you've started to mention a particular periodical, also the balance of paper and online materials. Yeah. I'd be yeah. curious to, um, to hear too how it changed, because this is a tumultuous 20 years that you're tracking. And if the kind of archival, you know, the archive that's extant um, changed over those 20 years. Yeah, well, the archive of materials is really interesting. And, you know, of course, um, it's very standard in some ways. And so in the 1930s or so, I was reading lots of French newspapers, periodicals, weekly cultural magazines that would list all the things going on in Paris, that kind of thing. But also, of course, there's a four or five year period there where the archive of Parisian materials is German. That is, the Germans were taking over, had taken over French culture, French journalism. Uh, this affects the movies in lots of other ways, but the Franco of the war. And then after the war is into a kind of progressive liberation, kind of an archive where the material culture of France is very much tied up with that kind of a progressive uh, ethic of what will Paris be like? the war. So the archive goes, is always mundane. It's the daily newspapers, that kind of thing in Paris. But it's always also inflected by who's in charge of Paris, what's just ha happened in Paris. And you can read various political events through just what the archive is and what the everyday materials are. Did the journalists really change during the occupational period? So did, I imagine the Germans took some people out, put other people in. Well, what's interesting is, you know, one of the great if that's the term to use, one of the great film critics in France during the 1930s and early 1940s was Robert Brasselas, who of course uh, became a leading fascist collaborator in France during the war and was the only man executed in France for intellectual collaboration. That is the work he did in journalism. So in fact, in some ways, you have this direct connection between the film journalism in France during the 30s and the collaborationist uh, journalism in France during the uh, 40s. And it's interesting to see the names that pop up, the names of respected film historians who were writing in, in France during the occupation. So, and also one of the goals of the occupying force was to show that things hadn't really changed. So in fact, in some ways, the film journalism in Paris, the everyday film cu culture is similar, mm -hmm. even though it's so incredibly different too. The Germans published two French film fan magazines in French that sort of took the place of so much of the uh, French fan, fan literature. They maintained ciné clubs at the time. So the film culture of Paris is both the same and quite different. We might talk more about that more fully later on, but it does have an impact on the kind of archive that's available. To take, a, to take a step back, could you um, discuss sort of how you approach breaking up these fascinating 20 years into chapters? Yeah, sure. Um, and in some ways it's random, in some ways it's historiographically justified. Um, at first what I wanted to do, and this is the beginning of the book, just kind of set up what is the geography of Paris as it relates to cinema, where the cinemas are, how the movies move through them, what neighborhoods have more of the cinemas than others. So the first part of the book is simply a look at how do we understand the cinema physically, architecturally in Paris at this time? Where were they? How do films move through the city? What can we start to say about the preferences? So it sort of just sets up, says 
cinematic in Paris at this time. Um, these were primarily the commercial places to see films, the narrative films from Hollywood, France. And so next I try to get at this sort of vast network of cine clubs in Paris at the time. And really, I'm not sure there's another city at the time like Paris in terms of the cine clubs before or since. Uh, you wouldn't know much more about uh, uh, cities in Germany, but I don't think there's anything quite like this in London, Berlin, or elsewhere. So the next chapter in the book is very much about the administration, bureaucracy, and practices of the film clubs. Uh, and there were dozens of them there. And you know, the cine clubs might show silent films once sound is the dominant form. They might show banned films like Potemkin uh, or standard commercial films. But of course, the cine clubs are always marked by discussions by filmmakers, critics, intellectuals about what people had just seen. And this was even true of the cine clubs for kids, where there would always be an expert there, a filmmaker there, an artist there, an intellectual there to tell kids what they had just seen in the Mickey Mouse film that they had watched. So there's this you know, really very interesting intellectual tr tradition in Paris that makes the cine club much more than the commercial film space, the equal of the museum, the concert hall, that kind of thing. Uh, then I took a close look at who the important stars were in Paris at the time, and especially uh, how the public might interact with stars. And we might you know, talk a bit about this later on too, it always seems to come up, but we have to keep in mind that major stars at this time were international commodities. And so that was certainly true of American stars in Paris where Garba was very po popular, Joan Crawford. And also uh, we have to think about French stars, like Chevalier, Jean, Jean Gabin, Michel Morgan, who as much as French stars were also Algerian stars, Morocco star, Moroccan stars, they were stars in kind of a global empire, French film. So the start of my study is both very particular to Paris, who seemed to be popular then, and also to try to get some kind of an understanding of how that stardom, how that French stardom functioned elsewhere, and how American stardom might function in Paris. Um, then, of course, I talk about the other uses of cinemas at the time, and the cinemas became kind of a public space too. One of the interesting things about the 1930s is that cinemas in Paris often became fascist spaces where fascists would organize for a meeting, a night or the film, that kind of thing. And so the cinemas became- Before the Germans, just so I can say. Before the Germans, yeah, this is, <laughs> yes, they were sort of setting things up for what right. they- Getting Germans ready. The cinema became a space of fascist practice and violence at this time as well. There were pitched battles at cinemas between fascists, leftists, police, that kind of thing, all of which prepared for the takeover of French cinema by the Germans during, during World War II, not only French production, but the cinemas themselves. And of course, the goal of the Germans was to make life and Occupy Paris seem as if nothing had changed. And the central part of that was the cinema and to make going to the movies seem as normal as it was, but of course it never was. And as you know, there were a number of major spaces that were uh, solely there for German soldiers to go to and that the French could never go to. But still there was this attempt to make French cinematic space the sign of the normality of Paris now being fascist. Uh, and then the cinema has a major role to play in the liberation of Paris and France. Of Raiders of Paris and the cinema itself becomes this sign of the renewal of Paris and the great moment of the return of French stars who had spent the war in Hollywood now could come back to France, make films there and the return especially of American films which hadn't been seen in five years and so one of the first great heroes of the liberation is Deanna Durbin, whom we don't think of much now, or if we do, we think of her as kind of a precocious uh, operatic star who, could, who became a huge star for a few years in movies, but never quite the equals to Garland. Uh, but in 1945, 1944, she is the great heroine of Paris because her American film is the first film to play there in five years. So we also get some interesting moments of history that might not make full sense to us now, but were really important then. 
And so that's the scope of the book from about 1930 or so in the introduction mm -hmm. of sound to 1950, the first five years after liberation. And of course, the 1950s are marked by a vast bureaucratic and administrative and aesthetic shift in French film. So it seemed like a convenient time to stop the study. Mm -hmm. Great. No, I mean, I think that you capture that really um, extremely well, picking out kind of localized case studies, but also giving a, a sense of this arc of time, which was just so fascinating. So, Thank you. Um, I, I, to step back, I guess, to a little bit of something that you mentioned before, you said that your research on the book helped you think about the geography of Paris in a different way. And I was wondering if there were any real surprises for you and kind of what cinemas were in what neighborhoods and how it conjured a kind of new geography of the city for you. Yeah, yeah, I think that was interesting. And, you know, uh, it really did give me kind of a, a different sense of the map of Paris. Um, and uh, one of the things that's interesting about pa Paris is that, you know, as I was saying, I was fairly used to going to the movies in, in LA. So that was kind of my template for a cinematic space. Uh, but things are quite different in par Paris. They're not at all like what I was used to. And of course, the built environment of Paris is very different, very old. And so the cinematic space is very much part of that old space of the city. Uh, interestingly, too, much of the new building in Paris, at least during the 1930s, during the Depression, was of cinemas. There wasn't much else going on in terms of building at the time. Cinemas were booming. So in, so in part, the old space of Paris is taken over by cinemas. And so too are the new spaces now, the cinematic spaces, because that's the kind of building that was going on. And you can get a sense of uh, spatial demography in Paris too. For instance, there were probably during this period around 300 or so cinemas in Paris between 1930 and 35 and 1950 or so. And they were spread throughout the various uh, neighborhoods, but um, there were no cinemas around the Louvre, which is this vast spatial behemoth. That is, so there were no cinemas anywhere near there. And the places with the most cinemas tended to be the more working class districts on the outskirts of pa Paris. The elite cinemas tended to be on the inside along the Great Avenues, the Champs Elysees and places like that. So you really do get a sense of a classed Paris. You get a sense of the age of space and you get a sense too of uh, cinemas as being important to neighborhoods and people apparently tend to, to stay in their own neighborhoods. And cinemas also as part of a vast cultural network along the Champs Elysees and other great avenues that uh, would ca cater to a different kind of crowd. So you can read a number of different aspects of Paris. Interestingly, I couldn't find any political differences in the cinemas there that you might find in other parts of Europe where a cinema might be a communist one or a, you know, but in Paris, that doesn't seem to be the case. But they do team seem tied to neighborhoods in cer certain ways and classed in certain ways. And could you describe, um, cause I think this is laid out really nicely in the book as well sort of what the trajectory of a film would be as it opened, maybe at the more prestige cinemas in a certain yeah. neighborhood and uh, some of the second maybe, and then they move down. Sure, uh, typically the, uh, a film would open in Paris and then it might open in Marseille, Lyon, Lille, someplace like that. So Paris was very much the first and most important Parisian location for film. Sometimes they would open in the same pla places, but it was always Paris, sometimes another place, very often not. What was interesting too is that <clears throat> in terms of France and the colonies, uh, Algiers was often a much more important space for films than let's say Marseille, Nantes, Lille. And the film might come to Algiers before it really plays fully through pa Paris as well. So French film at this time, the geography of French film begins in Paris extends, of course, to other urban spaces in France, but also very much takes in uh, Casablanca, Algiers, and other spaces in North Africa, too. So French cinematic geography follows the route of colonialism and realism, too. Uh, in studying American films, 
we're used to very precise systems of films moving through a city, opening downtown, disappearing for a few weeks, opening in the neighborhoods, disappearing for a few weeks, opening in more neighborhoods. The French cinema, at least with Paris as a model, isn't quite so precise as that. And so you might find the same film playing in a neighborhood a block or two away. You might find uh, uh, one film playing in a one place for a whole year. You might find a film playing for a single week and fanning out to 20 different places. So much like you know, the day of French film history at this time, distribution and exhibition are all typically seemingly in chaos and don't fully make sense. We might be able to find some indications of very local preferences for stars and for types of film. By the way, film might play in a neighborhood and never go any place else. Mm -hmm. So we also get these, these uh, this proof of sort of micro level mm -hmm. of fandom and audience. But for the most part, we get a much different view from the fully precise geometric use of space that we see in the US to the one we have in, uh, in Paris. Do, do you have an example of that where there might be like a, a micro preference in a specific neighborhood? Sure, uh, sure. Um, uh, and, and this is one of the interesting things about, um, uh, about French film at the time. <clears throat> Star, if we get back to stars, for instance, there are stars of, who are fully internationalized. Marie Chevalier, of course, is the great example of an international star at this time, who is French based in the US, but is French. In Paris alone, though, there are stars who seem to have a fully local appeal, someone like George, George Milton, who we don't know at all, and who seem to play, whose films seem to play mostly in the, um, in the peripheral neighborhoods of Paris, not even in the main large cinemas in what would be the town. Um, and so we can, and it's unclear if that's because of the, just the vagaries of a chaotic system of exhibition, or if it really does seem to speak to precise neighborhood appeals. Also in the 1930s and after the war, the government is always trying to investigate what's going on with the French film market. And there's an inquiry in 1937, uh, what is the future of French film that the, uh, that the government is on? And they have a host of intellectuals and artists talking about this. And one of them says, the problem with French film is that uh, the greatest French star in 1937, let's say is, 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 Fernandel, the great comic star. And the intellectual who te testifies about this says the is huge in small towns and in the rural spaces, and they hate him in, in Paris. I'm not sure that that was true, but you get a sense too of Paris being seen as a very different kind of a space than other parts of mm -hmm. France too. So we have both the micro levels in Paris and also the, the presumed differences between Paris and the rest of France. <clears throat> and also the similarities between Paris and let's say uh, Algiers that might be quite different from, from Paris and other cities in France. So that seems so, which makes this problematize a little bit what even French national cinema might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was actually, um, I guess, the segue to maybe a last question or two before we open it up. So if you have questions, just please put them in the Q&A function uh, on Zoom right. webinar. It should be down there in the, uh, the function bar. Um, more about actually the methodology of the book and your approach to yeah. um, theory, I guess, quote unquote theory, or just an overall academic approach yeah. uh, in the book. Because I think in some ways, Paris is the marquee topic of the book. Yeah. But actually, you're up to something quite uh, very innovative here, I think. and it. Um, really nicely plays out what I think is an important direction in film studies in general, uh, namely something that we could call exhibition and reception studies. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering if you could say a few words about that and then as an example, maybe, or a case study of its impact about this topic of national cinema, because yeah. for so long we had concepts of national cinema in our heads and there were all book series, national cinema. Yeah. And I think that's really yeah. come under re-examination. 
Yeah, I think probably the way I'm talking about film dates to the last 30 years or so. Uh, uh, first of all, this interest in exhibition in audience is very much a throwback to the way film studies was done in the teens, 20s and, and 30s. <clears throat> but that really fell out of film studies for many years. So the way I'm doing it now is very much a function of the mid to late 1980s or so, 1990, and renewed interest in the film audience, film exhibition, that kind of thing. Uh, in some ways, films become less of a humanities discipline and more of a social science one because of this interest in the sociology and the industrial aspects of cinema. Um, and at the same time, film studies has moved away from the sense we had in the 70s, let's say when I first started grad school, that the audience was shaped in uniform ways by the film text. Uh, that was almost a psychoanalysis as it was applied to film. Uh, and I think since then we have a greater understanding of a variety of interactions between the audience and the film. Uh, and there's no monolithic way of understanding that viewers interact with the films that they see. And one of the things we try to do is find material of that interaction. <clears throat> And that can be hard to come by. And it's always hard to say when anything provides absolute proof. Um, but still, it's been the practice now to understand kind of the micro audience for film, as opposed to a grand audience, all of which is shaped by a film in the same way. So we have a different kind of idea of how the film viewer works in film. And much of that has been because of the availability of materials that we've had in the last 30 years. So, and one of the things that's done, as you said, is change our thinking about what national cinema might be. And we have seen the, an unproblematic sense of the nation in film. That is, where does the film come from? Who made the film? What language is spoken in the film? To a, to a much more complicated sense of what the nation might mean. And first, we have to think of major cinemas in the same ways as as international commodities so that we now know that before World War I, let's say, uh, American cinema was large because those were the films that were playing here. After World War I, French cinema becomes largely uh, American because those are the films that are playing there. And also, as I said, cinema is bound up too in the histories of colonialism and imperialism so that French cinema is largely by Algerian, Moroccan, Indo-Chinese. It's the cinema there too. Um, but as well, when you study film culture broadly, audience, exhibition issues, that kind of thing, you find out once again that national cinema becomes fragmented uh, because there are real divisions or at least imagined ones between how cinema might be experienced in Paris and elsewhere in France. So the nation has become this very complicated space that is both bigger than we thought in some ways and also much, much smaller uh, as, as a meaningful term. Great, thanks. Um, I think we have one question from uh, Karen Kaplan. Has this project- um... No, 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 no. I... <laughs> <laughs> now that it's concluded. <laughs> that you've heard of her. Uh, now that it's concluded, opened up new projects or led to new research for you? Well, that's a very generous question from Karen Ka Kaplan. And uh, the answer is yes, um, in a couple of ways. One of the things that's happened is I'm able to, because of the materials that are available, is I'm able to continue to work on Paris, even if no one else wants to see, see this. But uh, the other thing is that working on Paris, and I found this out very early on, working on Paris, not, not only working on the rest of France, but working on North Africa and other of the colonial spaces uh, where France was po powerful. So in fact, now I'm doing some work on um, the cinematic space places like Algiers, uh, which was a, a, a vital place for seeing film then and had a vital film culture and is really completely, has completely disappeared from the record. And all I can use are the sources from Francophone materials. I can't use the Arab ones because I can't read those and those are not readily available. But uh, it was interesting how talking about Paris 
And I understood all along that it would mean talking about France, often talking about the US, but I didn't anticipate it at the time moving to French colonial spaces. And that's part of the project that I've taken up now, uh, trying to understand what French cinema means in spaces that are French by force of military takeover. I'm moving gently in that direction, even I, as I continue to work on France and especially other spaces in France too. I guess just a quick follow up before we get to, um, we have a couple of other questions. Um, do the, were there different publications in Algiers, Algeria? Like was there a totally different yeah, publication yeah. here or were they getting the same magazines? As there is a, a fairly specific Algerian film culture, which includes not, well, it's complex. Uh, the film journalism in Algiers was largely Algerian. And I, I, I haven't seen much evidence of French journalism coming there. What's interesting is the cinematic chains, that is the chains of theaters we see in Paris, Pathé, Gaumont, and others also in Algiers. And uh, the names of theaters are always double of those of Paris. Colisée, Empire, Montpensier. So there's very much the evidence of French film being there all the time, as well as a kind of a specific French, as well as a specific, a specific Algerian film culture. So it's a very interesting hybrid of local and also foreign. Good, and we have a question from the chat from uh, Brian Sway. Did you find good examples of mes messaging that uh, Nazi propagandists were promoting through control of the cinemas during World War II? Well, this is really interesting. And <clears throat> on the one hand, the Nazi control of French film is determined to make it seem as normal as possible. So the Nazis create a film studio Continental, which has this kind of vague name that could be any place at any time. That look like French films. They have French stars, you know. The Nazis, as I said, also begin two French film magazines, uh, Cinemonde and Vedette, that look like French film magazines, although there are more German actors in them, but still they're very, very French. The Germans, on the other hand, also try to impose German stars on France. I have a ch chapter that's largely about a German star, Brigitte uh, Horney, uh, who was a very big star in Germany at the time, whom the Germans try to impose on France, in part by saying that her brand of intellectualism, cosmopolitanism, is rich, and so the French should, in fact, love her. Now, that said, while the cinema, so is always the sign of the normal at this time, even though, of course, it's not. And even though, of course, part of what's normal about cinema at this time is also how strange German stars, there are these film magazines that are new, and controlled by, uh, by Germans. The Germans also tried to institute a kind of cross-national cooperative thing going on. They would always have French stars making trips to German studios and they would all meet under the sign of cinema for sort of a pan-German Europe. At the same time though, there's no question that the Germans used the cinema as a means of surveillance. It was a great place to spy on pe people. And also of course, some of the most uh, vexed moments of resistance in Paris in 1942, 43 and 44 were uh, mini riots at the projection of German newsreels. Uh, so in fact, we have both. We have the Germans doing everything they could to make the Parisian film scene normal, and also the evidence that it never was. I mean, one of the ways they changed- I hope that answers the question. No, I think it's fascinating. Um, one of the ways it changed the cinema radically was that they banned American films, right? And films from elsewhere in the world. Well, of course, this is the major, yes, of course, I should mention this, that in the occupied zone, uh, American films were banned almost immediately in 1940. I think the surrender is in the middle of June, 1940, and, film, and uh, American films are banned the next week. So in fact, you have this interesting few week pe period of absolute difference. As the Germans advance on Paris in June, all of the cinemas close. 
uh, and it becomes the project of the Germans to reopen as many as possible and to make the film scene seem normal, even though there are no American films there. Uh, and American films were probably making up anywhere from 30 to 50% of the product at this time in France. Mm. And so this was a huge shift. And of course, it meant the Germans had to pr produce an awful lot of films too, but that's the major shift. Uh, American films aren't banned in Vichy until 1942, mm. but they're banned almost immediately in Paris. And it marks the significant shift in the cultural scene in Paris, I think more than anything else. And it showed the enormity of the German project of trying to make the film scene appear normal when it really couldn't, there were no American films. And interestingly, the only newspaper notices I've seen for American film at all during this time was when a famous American movie star would die. There are significant obituaries in French newspapers for Carol Lombard when she dies in January 1942. For Leslie Howard when he is shot down by a German plane in 1943 obituaries for Conrad Veidt, who was a German star who moved to the US. As far as I can tell, the only journalistic mention of American film at this time is obituaries of famous stars, and that's it. So the Germans allowed that coverage of death. The Germans, allowed, yes, yes, this culture of death would oh, allow- The down of an American- Obituary, yeah. Yeah. yeah, right, right. Um, I think we have one from the chat window that's a good follow-up, and then I'll, I'll get to the Q&A window uh, with a question from Chris Fallon. Uh, it's interesting. This is from uh, Marie Reagan uh, or Regan. It's interesting to hear about the German French film magazines and star cultivation during occupation. Could you talk a little more about the transition in cinema at the end of the war? The transition in cinema at the end of the war. Sort of how uh, France transitioned back, I guess, to normal yeah. or something like that. Once normal. again, it's very interesting. As you know, um, there was pitched fighting in the streets of Paris. And so, in fact, as the war ends, the cinemas close. Uh, just like had, the same thing takes place when the war starts, when the Germans advance, the cinemas close. So in fact, the beginning of the war, the beginning of the occupation and the end of the war are both marked by the closure of cinemas. And so the first project of the Parisian, of, of Parisian film cult culture is to get the cinemas back open. Uh, and then, films start to come in fairly quickly, many of them I think coming in from North Africa where they had been playing before this because North Africa had been liberated a couple of years before. Um, the real shift or the real moment that the French film culture seems to be what it was before the war is not in the films being seen, but in the stars who come back, the directors who come back. And it's a gigantic story in France and Paris when uh, Simone, Simone comes back, Michel Morgan, who's a gigantic star, com comes back, when Jean Gabin comes back, and especially, and we might not tend to think of this now, but when René Claire comes back, the director, that's the real sign that French film cu culture is back. And of course, as you know, there were a number of French stars who were tried in France for being collaborationists, uh, Arletti, Daniel, yeah. but as much as that, as much as the revenge on these stars marked the liberation, so too does the return of stars to make films, of directors to make films, as much as the return of American film. So there's kind of this vast repatriation that marks that the French cinema has come back to where it was in 1939, let's say. Uh, French film journalism stays kind of the same. And in fact, there might be even more of it. And Andre Bazin starts to review films at this time. And you know, we have the beginning. We would see names we would recognize from the 50s as well. So we have French film journalism kind of entering a modern phase with the names we know now, and especially Bazan, whose reviewing career begins, I think, in 1944 or 45. And he is one of the ones who just waxes eloquent about Deanna Durbin being now in Paris. He loves her. Um, 
And uh, so that's, again, one of the signs of the return. Great. And I, I, one other, I guess, uh, redundant follow-up is that the American films came back. I mean, the anecdote I, ever, I always heard was that we use the phrase film noir to discuss those crime thrillers because there was a flood of American films after the war, after the Nazis had banned them. If you and look at the film, yes, if you look at a film ske schedule in Paris from 1946, because it, it takes about a year, a year and a half to really get it fully back up and running. The films there are incredible and audiences are seeing Citizen Kane, Double Demony, the Maltese Valley, the films that, you know, Americans had been seeing between 1941 and 1945 that are now all playing there. So uh, certainly film noir is a big deal and that's where the term comes from. And apparently it's the critics who are seeing a whole bundle of these films for the first time, these detective films, these urban gritty films. Uh, what's interesting is though, um, what gets written about even more in the everyday press is the return of Walt Disney, the return of Ernst Lubitsch, the return of Claudette Col Colbert. You wouldn't get a sense <clears throat> from the everyday film journalism that something like film noir is being discovered. You just get this sense of this really nostalgic return of films that people love, the stars that people love. But certainly you're absolutely right that the term film noir dates from I think the perhaps from Bord and Schomaton and their work and the book that they write that identifies this as a cycle of films. And this is an area that you know more of than I do, but I think it does date from 1945 or 46 when at least some French intellectuals are struck by the way these films look and sound. And it's like nothing they've ever seen or it reminds them of some of the French films of the 30s, like Quai des Brume and that kind of thing. The other, yeah. wave, the other wave I was thinking about in the uh, immediate post-war period was Italian neorealism, like Rossellini and, well, uh, like, uh, and whether fact, they made much of an impact there. Yeah, what, what, one of the great hits of the post-war per period is Rome, Open City. And uh, you can look at listings of films in Paris anytime from 1947 to 49 or so, and it's always showing there. Now, <clears throat> some of this and some of these films playing in Paris might have to do with distribution systems still not being quite what they were before the war. So once a film comes to France, it stays in France and keeps play, playing there. But the evidence is that Italian neorealism is itself big, but Roman city seems to be the film that galvanizes par Paris. Mm -hmm. That's the film that really seems to introduce new possibilities for cinema, much more than Bicycle Thieves, much more than other neorealist films from, from the period that we know now. That's the film that really makes French intellectuals stand up and take notice. And it seems to have been a popular film just among the public as well, because as I said, the film is always there. Rossellini becomes this avatar of the future of cinema. It is a film, of course, about urban resistance to Nazi occupation, right? Including working yeah, class Yeah, of course, it makes perfect yeah. sense. Yes, yes, it makes perfect sense, yeah. We have a question uh, in the Q&A window from uh, Chris Fallon. Um, as these films, Chris Fallon, yes, as our these co films, colleague. our colleague, yes, as these films, so expect a hard question, you ready, you're brave. <laughs> <laughs> as these films moved through the different spaces and places and the print as a material object began to degrade, did you find any yeah. evidence that this altered reception, uh, this altered reception or became an issue for audiences? What a great question. And, you know, this is something we tend not to think about now, but, um, there weren't endless prints of these films. In the US, I know this, that there were, that when Hollywood would issue a film, they would only make about 250 prints. So that when you were seeing a film in a small town in Indiana in its 12th run, you were seeing a film that looked completely different from the film as it played in its first run in Chicago. I haven't seen evidence of that in Paris. What you do see evidence of in Paris is um, films would typically open there. This is true for American films and films from other foreign places. <clears throat> Most American films would open in Paris in English. And then as they went to the neighborhoods, they would play with subtitles. And so the discussion would often become, what film do you see? What print of the film is the best one to see? I wouldn't see so much evidence of the degraded prints of films 
as I would see evidence of a degraded experience of film for those people who didn't like a subtitled film, or a kind of a populist response where a dubbed film is the film for us, that's the film for the people. So the discussion is much more often about language and the differences between a film you might see on the, in one of the grand cinemas on the uh, Champs Elysees and a film you might see in the working class 20th arrondissement. It's more, much more typically about the change in sound than it is the change in visuals. But I have no doubt that Chris is right and that uh, the film you would see in Paris in its first run was very different from the film you would see in Paris three months later. And that film would then be shipped to Fez or to Morocco or Casablanca or something. And that print would look different too. We tend not to think about those gradations of the viewing experience. But as I said, my evidence is mostly about discussions about sound and what sound do people want in film, especially those films that come from the U.S. Yeah, and you do discuss the transition to sound, right, in the way that cinema changed the cinema landscape. On, the yeah, it's really around. interesting. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we often talk about sound. It seems to happen overnight, but it actually takes a long time. If we think about sound technology coming in 1927 or so, <clears throat> it's not until 1931, the end of the year, that really all of the cinemas in Paris are wired for sound. And sound also ch changes the way that people appreciate film. Uh, we have subtitles coming in fairly soon in Paris. And for instance, the subtitle film became a kind of a literary event in Paris at this time. One of the great hits of 1931 is Machen in Uniform, the great German film by Leontine Sagan. And when that film plays in a subtitled print in Paris, the celebration around that film is that the subtitles have been written by Colette. And that's a very big deal. So the subtitled film becomes, as I said, a sort of a literary event in Paris at this time, uh, even though there's lots of discussion about if you should see a film dubbed or subtitled or what ha have you. And also how films open is always vexed. Most films, as I said, from the US, open uh, in French. A film like Frankenstein was a big, but only showed in a dubbed version. And in talking about the violence that often took place at cinemas, one of the really pitched battles in French film history takes place in 1930 when an early Fox film, Fox Follies of 1929, a completely innocuous film, plays uh, in Paris and the crowd tears the theater apart because the subtitles are so bad, they can't stand being spoken to in English. It's kind of a typical Parisian response at the time. It doesn't take much to get Parisians to riot at this time, you know? And they rioted because of the sound of the film and the way the English sounded to them and the way the uh, subtitles seemed to so damage the narrative of the film. So sound itself is really a vexed issue for a number of years. Right, and actually related to your point about uh, girls in uniform, we have a question from our German colleague, Gail Finney. Oh, great, uh, oh, Gail, good. What about Weimar cinema and German expressionist films in France after 1945? Oh, was after it, 1945, well, right. well there's a, a trick question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> was it an evidence or did anti-German sentiment stand in the way of it? Well, I should back up and say there's a, that there's a significant place for a Weimar film, that is the films made in Germany between 1919 and 1933 in, France throughout that period. That is, Metropolis is a huge hit and other films uh, play in uh, really state. The cine clubs are German films from the 20s. After 1945, and as I said, my study ends around 1950 or so. After 1945, it's very hard to find any German film in Paris at the time. German film industry itself is, you know, not fully up and running at this. You would rarely see, even in the cine clubs, evidence of German film from the 20s. You might see a, you know, you might see a Murnau film. He doesn't really seem to count as a German film filmmaker in, in some ways. But after 1945, at least 1950, it's very hard to find evidence of German films made before 1933, even at the clubs, which would be the place where they would be shown. And again, there might be political reasons for that. There also might be issues of how you even get the films. Uh, certainly, 
the Cinémathèque Française begins in 1936. I don't doubt that they had German films there. And those are the listings I couldn't find. And that may have been the place to see Weimar film. But I'm not even sure about that, at least through the 50s. It's a good question, though, because there was a vast audience for German films in the 20s and 30s. And then it seems to disappear. Yeah, I mean, you discuss uh, besides Girls in Uniform, uh, West Front, West Front, 1918, oh, well, Pops. And yeah. Pops seems to have kind of a following in Paris in the 20s and 30s, but of course he went on. Yeah. Yeah. Di Di the films he made with Louise Brooks and uh, uh, West Front, 1918, is a very important film. There are two great anti war films that open in Paris at the same time, All Quiet on the Western Front and West Front, 1918. And uh, both films are taken up not by Cine clubs, but by the political clubs who want to talk about what those films say about the future of war in uh, Europe. And again, one of the instances of fascist violence in French cinemas before World War II is the fascists who tore the theater apart at the place where West Front 1918 was playing. It's, I think it's fair to say it's an anti war film. It's, you know, and uh, French fascists just tore the place apart because the film was play, playing there. So, you know, there's also this, after 1945, there might be this memory of the sort of vexed place of German films in Paris in the uh, 30s. But German films always do seem to carry this extra valence of meaning in France. Right, I mean, maybe uh, to close out the discussion, because we're just about at six and I, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, you could talk a little bit about the blog uh, you're running, because oh. I think in some ways the best news about this book is that it's going to live on in perpetuity <laughs> on, on the internet um, and that it will continue to kind of unfold its research project, right? Well, thank you for asking me about that. You know, as I was finishing the book up, uh, I realized I had tons of material I was never really going to use. Um, and so I just started to blog about it. I was at a very good place in my career with tenure, one can do blogs. Uh, and so I was able to do that. And I was able to put some of the material I couldn't use in, in, in the book in an ongoing blog about Paris. It's called the Paris Cinema Project. It's on WordPress. And it's just been a place for me to uh, write short entries about things that interest me that are connected to the book. Um, one of the good things about doing the blog, and as I said, I was doing it as I was finishing up the book, short informal blog post is a great way to fool yourself into writing. And so some of that writing did find its way into the book, but now it's become a great way of getting my scholarship out, out there of trying things out, sort of holding a place for certain thoughts. Uh, and two of my short blog entries I've now developed into articles. So it's been a great place for me to kind of warm up uh, about things. I should say it's very low tech. It's, you know, it's, you know, it's just there, written, that's about it. But it's been a, a really fun thing for me to do. And uh, as I said, if I can put in a plug for it, it's called, it's at the Paris Cinema blog. It's called the Paris Cinema Project on WordPress. And it's just been a very fun place for me to write things quickly that interest me. It's typically centered on Parisian film from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And then we'll branch out to the rest of France, Algeria, you we have know. a request for it. Uh, do you have the to put the link in the chat window? I guess I could. I, could I, I will do that. I can. Yeah. Yes, I will. <laughs> Chris Fallon has now popped up in the chat window, frequenting the Q and A window. I well, I'll send it. Yes. Uh, can I put a put a link up in chat? Yes. I think I hear Jamie. Before you leave, I think I can do that. Uh, and here, I'm going to do that. Right and you said, I, I think Karen asked this question too, you're currently working as much on the kind of colonies and the distribution systems, exhibition systems in the colonies as well. You mentioned Algeria. Is it true in um, Indo Indochine too, or? Yes. But there were. Yeah. Um, nope. Well, yeah, and, and in fact, uh, uh, Hanoi is, a, of course, a central place for French films to play. And uh, Hanoi was a bit, and Indochina in general, was a bit more of an outpost than North Africa, I think, just because of geography. But that, too, was a central place. So the reach of French national film is fully out to uh, Asia um, in, very, in very interesting ways. And the French uh, 
And there is a significant, especially expat French film culture in Indochina at this time, as there is in China, which has a French mm. zone. So mm. in fact, there are international spaces we might not tend to think of right offhand in thinking about French film, but we're significant markets for French film uh, and for broadly speaking, French film culture. And you like in Shanghai in China? Or? In Shanghai, yeah. yeah, in Shanghai. I'm sorry, yes, in Shanghai where there was a French zone. Uh, there was a not insignificant market for French film, mostly among the expats there. Hmm, interesting. Which of course well, ends by the late 1930s. Yeah, yeah I, I may have mentioned my grandmother was French speaking in Shanghai during the war, so oh, yeah. Well, then, in fact, uh, she was the audience who was right. born she's, she's Belgian, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what the yeah, French well, think about. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, well, th thanks so much, Eric. That was wonderful. Congratulations again on the book. It was really fun. And the blog. And we look, we look forward to reading more at the at oh. WordPress. Oh, wait, oh, it's the Paris Cinema blog. So thanks yes. again. Thanks, everybody, Maybe for coming. Thank you so much. Yep. And uh, the DHI will be running. A series of other programs we actually have one on Thursday with uh, Michael Hart, part of our Democracy in Crisis, Democracy and Movements series. That's Thursday, Michael Hart, I think at 4.30 on the DHI website. And then next week with Wendy Brown and James Vernon, part of the same series, Democracy in Crisis and Democracy in Movements. And then we have the Human Rights Film Festival coming up in November. So speaking of film culture. So thanks so much, Eric. That was wonderful. Thanks a lot to all of you. Good night, everybody. Stay healthy. Bye. Bye-bye.